Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is Sarah Sheridan. Sarah is a Scottish novelist, most famous for the Mirabel Bevan series, cosy crime noir mysteries set in 1950s Brighton, as well as a series of historical novels based on real life stories of late Georgian and early Victorian explorers. Your first book, Truth or Dare, featured in the Sunday Times Top 50, was nominated for the Saltar Prize and was listed in the Scottish Library's Top 100 Books. And in 2015, you were named one of the Saltar Society's 365 most influential Scottish women past and present. In 2016, with your daughter, you founded Reek, a fragrance company that speaks out against the lack of female memorialisation throughout history and challenges beauty industry norms. You're an active campaigner and feminist, a Twitter evangelist and self-confessed SWAT. You've appeared as a commenter on TV and radio and have sat on a variety of committees in writing organisations, as well as taking part in a plethora of writing exhibitions. You're also a patron of Edinburgh Charity It's Good to Give, which provides support for critically ill children and their families. Sarah, it's wonderful to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I've done you uh, justice with so the intro. Thinking, oh, this sounds great. And it's like, oh, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a very impressive resume. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And I'm very much looking forward to, yeah, finding mm. out a bit more about you know, your backstory and uh, what you've got planned for the future. So, I mean, the first question really is about, you know, the, your very beginning, uh, your childhood, your early life. If you can kind of set the scene and tell us what that was like. I was born in Edinburgh um, and brought up in Edinburgh, very, very middle class upbringing, very privileged upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, I was, my mother was dyslexic, okay. so my mother could never read to us. We never had stories. Um, she didn't realise she was dyslexic, actually, until she was into almost her 70s. And she had a friend who was a retired school teacher who said to her, oh, I think you might be dyslexic when she was having trouble reading something. And she went and got tested and of course she was. So yeah. for when I was growing up, my mum just thought she was a bit stupid. Really? And I was the weird kid in the family, you know, there's always got to be one. And out of me and my brothers and all my cousins, I was the weird one. I, I was just obsessed with story, you know, absolutely obsessed with story. And from a really young age, I mean, I learned to read really quickly mm. um, and then just consume, 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 consumed. And we had really not very many books in the house. Not because we usually when you say that, people think we were really poor and it wasn't that. It was just that my mother couldn't read and my father really didn't read. Okay. So, um, I was brought up as this kind of child who was, you know, all the other kids would be out playing with balls. You know, everyone was into sports. <laughs> and my mother would sort of fling a ball out the back garden in March and, the, you know, everyone else would come in muddy in October. And I'd been sitting in this shady study or, you know, some, some curly corner, a curl up corner I'd found somewhere reading, reading and reading and reading and getting really involved with reading. I believed everything that I read. Yeah. Um, Mum tells a story about coming in, to, um, coming in to wake me up for school one morning and, and pulling open the curtains. And I kind of crawled across the top of the bed, dragging my legs, going, Mum, I can't feel my legs. And she was horrified. And then I said, and you have to send me to Switzerland now. And of course, she panicked. She said for about three or four seconds, she thought, oh my goodness. And then she looked beside the bed and there was Heidi. And I had been reading Heidi and decided if only I could lose the use of my legs, I would be sent to Switzerland away from all these horrible sports playing boys oh who were God. knocking about our house yeah. <laughs> and have this wonderful adventure up a mountain <laughs> with cheese and a goat herd and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I really had that imaginative, you know, imaginative engagement from a very young age. Wow. And so mum did something that was very brave, actually, for a, a dyslexic person. She took me to our local library, which was Morningside Library. And um, I was kind of Matilda. I mean, you wouldn't let your kids walk from our house to Morningside Library now because you would think consider it quite dangerous. Yeah. But this was the 70s mm. and it was a, a 15 odd minute walk and I would go down and take out the books I wanted and come home and just disappear into this sort of magic world of stories. And, that, and that's really where I resided. Yeah. Um, and a very close family life. I mean, we're still very close, functionally very close although we are all very different. And I, I think I was very lucky to be brought up in a family which is largely extremely tolerant. So um, you know, very open conversations over dinner in a very extended family. So there would often be 15 people for dinner in our house. Wow. That wasn't unusual because I had an aunt and uncle and cousins around one corner and my granny lived up the road and another aunt and uncle up the other side of the street, you know. Mm -hmm. so there were always lots and lots of people around the house. 
um, none of whom agreed about religion, about um, politics, about anything. So we always had these kind of big conversations. And I think that's very helpful in developing your tolerance, developing your understanding of the other point of view. Yes. Um, so I feel and very honestly, lucky. Yeah. I feel very lucky actually to have been, and then also religiously, my father was Catholic, brought up Catholic, lapsed Catholic. My mother came from a Jewish background, although from a relatively young age, I decided I, I, I was an atheist, but you can be a Jewish atheist, that's okay. Um, so in that sort of Catholic, uh, Jewish background, you learn a lot of languages, you know, there's Latin and there's ancient Hebrew and there's Yiddish. Yeah. So growing up in a house where there was a lot of different words for everything, yeah. um, I think is really stimulating as well. Uh, and all the guilt, <laughs> that's the <laughs> downside of it. Yeah. All the different kinds of guilt uh, there are, you have all of those. Yeah. Um, but it was a kind of very um, unusual upbringing, I think, in some regards, that kind of particular mix. Yeah. Um, in Edinburgh in, in, in the 70s. And these very much had sort of different groups of people that you knew, you know, the people I went to school with, the, the my mother's Jewish friends, my father's friends from sports and from work, because my father was a, a great sportsman, um, and boxed uh, for a while and played football for a while. And, mm. and um, so, yeah, it was very rich kind of culturally, I suppose. I, I was literally thinking exactly that, very culturally diverse mm. uh, from, from an early life, yeah. You, I, I read somewhere that you said you went to, I believe it was an all girls school you went to. Yeah. And um, the teachers there, I think the concentration was largely on English and history, which is, seems fortunate. Yeah. They're, <laughs> they're very much getting the grounding for what it's you do now. It's good for me, yeah. yeah uh -huh. I mean, I think we had some great maths teachers actually as well, but maths was never going to be my thing. That's no. not the way my, my brain worked. But I have a friend who I was at school with who was into maths and she very much feels that there was great maths teachers, but that kind of passed me by because it wasn't my natural kind of, you know, my, the way my brain naturally kind of works. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, I, I think it was just jamminess, pure jamminess. I mean, hmm. the, the school was over the road from where we lived and mum had this great ambition to never have to do a school run. And so she chose the, the school for me that was over the road. The school for my brothers was, was around the corner and she'd just chuck us all out in the morning and we could walk to school from being, you know, from, from primary one. Um, wow. And <laughs> it, I, I think I had a really good education. I mean, uh, and in languages as well, we had great French teachers. I learned French, I learned German. I learned really good scratch French. I mean, in my teens, late teens, I would visit my brother and my uncle in Paris. Uh, my brother went to Paris to school for a little while. And you know, people would say to to me in French, "What part of Paris are you from?" Seriously? And that oh. was from you know, that was from that great education at school. And we had old-fashioned things like um, elocution. Mm. You know, we learned elocution mm. and we learned deportment and all of that kind of stuff as well. So I, I think yeah. it was a, a really good broad-based, very old-fashioned education. Um, so we didn't, there, w there wasn't really very much tech around at that point. I mean, yes. computers did exist, but you know, we, we were certainly weren't using them at school, but I feel very fortunate. And I bump into occasionally my English teacher, my history teacher, who used to live around the corner from here, actually. I used to go and visit her, but really? she's recently moved down south to be closer to her family because she's really quite elderly now. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, so very lucky, I think. In yeah. That. It, well, your, your education certainly has served you well. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So uh, obviously, and it, from an early life, um, you know, reading and, and consuming the books was your passion. Mm. At what stage did that change to becoming more of a kind of career focus, if you like? Oh, really quite late. I mean, I, I, it never, that, I never made that connection between, oh, I really like reading stories, maybe I could write one. Is that right? I mean, we wrote okay. stuff at school because, you know, you're at school and they tell you to. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to be a, a novelist or a writer um, or a historian or anything like that. I went off to Trinity College Dublin mm -hmm. and I decided to study English Lit because I was crazy mad for J.P. Dunleavy and Brendan Behan and all of these amazing Irish writers. Uh, went over to visit Trinity the year before I went and saw J.P. Dunleavy at a bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> I would be like oh, totally transfixed and not, uh, totally unable to say anything to him. Just think, oh my God, it's J.P. Dunleavy at the bus stop. So I went to Trinity and, and, and that was what I was interested in because I loved reading it and also mm -hmm. um, a, a, a Old English. So um, Anglo-Saxon effectively, which of course we learned German at school. So that was very helpful in that regard and loved all those old kind of sagas. And that felt very, very kind of close to, to that being part of where I come from, actually. Mm -hmm. And that kind of um, 
you know, oral tradition as well. It's a very oral tradition. I really love that. So these two things together made that a really good course for me and mm -hmm. off I went. And I think there was part of me as well that wanted to get away. You know, I was a bit of a rebel in my teenage years and I knew if I went to St Andrews or I decided to go down to Oxbridge or London or something, my parents would come and visit. <laughs> if I went to Dublin, <laughs> they were going to have to get on a plane and that was a much more serious proposition. They were less likely to turn up and, so, and, and I could make my own mark kind of thing. And, and I went off and, and loved, I mean, Dublin in the late 80s was glorious, absolutely glorious place to be relatively safe place to be um, and it felt very much like home it's the same size as Edinburgh it's got all the Celtic stuff same as Edinburgh um, yeah I just I, it, it felt like home for for those four or five years yeah that's brilliant <laughs> I looked on your LinkedIn profile and I was saying this um, before we started you appear to have had an um, sorry you appear to have had an incredibly linear career path in the sense mm. that all of your jobs have been kind of writers. Mm. Um, how did that kind of happen? How did your career unfold? I really don't know. Really? I mean, it looks very <laughs> linear. Someone said to me actually about two years ago, someone said, but you obviously had this great master plan. And I was like, no. Um, <laughs> it's not that I don't have a great master plan. I suppose I'm, I'm continually interested in the same stuff. Okay. And therefore it looks like it all holds together. I mean, even <coughs> Reek, which we'll go on to talk about, very mm -hmm. much ties in with my writing career and, and, you know, notionally. And that background, I should say as well, in, in history was very much um, influenced. My father was an antiques dealer. He was a brilliant antiques dealer. Mm -hmm. He has an amazing memory for stuff, you know, objects. Mm -hmm. So dad will remember a teapot that he saw 20 years ago oh. or, a, you know, he has that kind of memory. And so as a kid going to auctions, um, with my father, who looked very like Omar Sharif, he was very dapper, and mm. he would stand up at the back of the option and kind of bid like this, um, wow. and know what everything was and how it was made. And and as I said earlier, I, we we didn't have sort of bedtime stories growing up, mm -hmm. but that the dad provided that kind of function of telling us bedtime stories about objects. So he would come home and he'd have bought a snuff mill or a, a tiara or a you know piece of amazing Sevres porcelain. And he would say, let, let me show you this piece and tell you the story of who owned it. And, and so my interest in history was, yes, that academic side at school, and we had some really great teaching, but also that history of objects, of artifacts, of living within history, you know, the difference between those two things, because, you know, analysing the politics or um, analysing the social influences, but then what was it like to wear a corset or um, a tiara or how, you know, what was a snuff mill for, a pipe or a you know, any of the weird things that there, any of the weird sort of accessories, hip flasks and all that kind of stuff. How did that fit into your life and why would you want that? You know, why was that a luxury? Because mm -hmm. your sense of luxury changes sort of through, through time. So, um, yeah, that sort of stuff was really kind of rich, I suppose, as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in terms of becoming uh, a novelist, I mean, mm. your first book, I believe, was in 2005. Um, I, th I think it was, yeah. Oh God. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Truth or Dare, I think it was. I think it's 1998. Oh, was it really? Yeah, I think was it was it earlier that early. than that, was it? I think it was right, a little okay. bit earlier. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll need to double check the You've facts. You've maybe looked at a different edition. Oh, oh okay, mm. that could be it. Right, okay. So, I mean, what was the, the impetus? Why did you decide at that stage that you wanted to actually write something yourself? Um, this is a terrible answer and you're going to hate me. <laughs> um, I was married, um, I got married in da, 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 1990 um, and my first husband and I had separated and I had a young daughter. He was Irish and had gone back to Ireland. We'd been living in Ireland for a while, came back here mm -hmm. and um, basically I wanted to find something I could do at home. Huh. And it was literally like, right, what, how am I going to look after this child who's of nursery school age so that she's not in kind of education from eight in the morning till six at night, even at this young age? Mm -hmm. And look after me as well, because when you're a single parent, you're doing everything and you're looking after the house and the, you know, all the stuff. And I was finding working, I was working at the university settlement in Edinburgh. And it was kind of quite a high level admin job. Um, so it was a lot of pressure around that and quite long hours and things. And I thought, well, I really would rather be at home working from home. What can I do? 
And I sat down with a friend and we came up with a list of about, I don't know, 15 jobs that you could do from home, including things like set up a jam making company, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, all of these things that <laughs> I could do at home. And I decided that I was going to go for the first thing on the list, which was write books, because I thought, well, I'm sure I can do it. You know, I'd, I'd studied critical theory when I was at college and I thought I should really give that a bash. That's a really good option. So I quit my job. This is terrible advice. If you <laughs> meet somebody who wants to be a writer, do not tell them to do this. It's awful, awful way to go about it. But I quit my job and I, I you know, a novel 70,000 words. So I technically, um, you usually commission to a little bit more than that, but at the time I knew this. And so I was like, okay, if I write a thousand words a day, five days a week, like a job, in 14 weeks, I'll have a novel. Again, like this is a terrible plan, but I did it <laughs> and it worked. And Oh. I, I wrote the first book, Truth or Dare, that you were mentioning there is about 73,000 words long. So I was bang on. Wow. Um, knew nothing about publishing, you know, no contacts, no savvy, just had read a hell of a lot of books. And yeah. away I went and posted that off to, at the time there were 96 publishers of fiction in the UK. There's not that many anymore. But anyway, um, <laughs> and posted off 96 copies of this book wow. to everyone who could possibly have wanted it and a whole load of people who didn't. Um, and within three weeks, I had my first offer. So it was just very, ja I might Seriously. have gone on to the jam making. I could have gone on to the jam if it yeah. hadn't worked. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was, it wow. it was kind of a, a mixture of organization and determini de determination and, and luck, I suppose, as well, just luck. Because, yeah. you know, it's very difficult to sell a book. Even now, it's very difficult to sell a yeah. book. So I was very lucky. I think it's the quickest I've ever sold a book, actually, was that first one. Wow. It's because uh, I was thinking today, I mean, it must have been so different back then. Today, I suppose a lot of people would do the kind of Kindle publishing style, yeah. put it on Amazon or, you know, build a personal brand on social media and then look to distribute the book to their, their audience. Um, so it's a, a very different world back then. I suppose in some ways it, that might have been a blessing. It yeah, you can't tell. I mean, different, different strokes general. for different folks, isn't it? How yeah. it works. I mean, those creative careers, people always come to occasionally run a mentoring seminar or something for you know the book trust or someone like that you go along yeah people say how do i do it and of course there is no it in any creative career writing or acting or any of those things there's your way that you do it and i think i was just very lucky that that all clicked together and therefore i was encouraged because it wasn't always so easy yeah. and you know later on in my career i was like okay well actually maybe i need to apply myself to this because by then i knew i loved it um, but mm. I didn't really when I started, which I feel slightly guilty about because, again, you often meet people who've been writing a book for 10 years and, you yeah. know, and literally it was a kind of, you know, 16 week <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> plus three weeks to get it sold. You know what I mean, it wasn't, yeah. you know, it wasn't the, the, the trauma that it can be. Yeah. Uh, but but fascinating uh, all the same. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll come on to the Mirabelle Bevan mysteries after. I think this is a, an ideal time to ask you a few questions around the actual writing process, your mm. creative process. How do you get yourself in the kind of frame of mind to sit down and, and write? How does that happen? <laughs> well, I suppose it's like an accountant getting into the frame of mind to go in and do some <laughs> figures. Do you know what I mean? You, you, you know, I, I, I love writing. Um, but you need to produce in order to finish that book. You know, a book's a marathon, so you mm -hmm. need to keep running. And um, I still, I, I still set myself word targets. So initially, it used to be a thousand words a day, five thousand words a week, and that was what I would do, and that was my job. Uh, now the books get split up kind of differently because I write different kinds of books. So I've mm -hmm. um, the, the Mirabelles that you've mentioned, the historicals you've mentioned. I've also been writing nonfiction a bit recently, both commercial nonfiction. So. Last year I wrote a book about Queen Victoria for ITV to tie yeah. in with one of their series. Mm -hmm. I've just finished the first draft of a book for Historic Environment Scotland, um, which commemorates some of Scotland's amazing uh, female history mm -hmm. uh, and, ha and looks at how that's commemorated within our built culture. I wrote a children's book this year as well I with my daughter. Say, yeah. So there's quite <laughs> a few different things. So I tend to have a kind of right, this book's got to be 80,000 words. How am I going to write those 80,000 words in this frame in the diary? Well, there's a lot of other stuff in because there's obviously a lot of stuff going on. So I'm going to put in 5,000 words that week and 8,000 words this week and, and split it up like that and make an actual writing plan. And then you're just lucky you've got the time. I mean, this whole kind of, oh, writer's blog thing that people get, that's from just having a lot of time on your hands, mm. I think. Mm. And as you write more and more, I mean, I've, I've written 20 something books now. I, I'm not sure how many, including some ghost writing and things. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
you, you, you have the craft skills to do it. You know, when you, when you write your first book, you don't know if you can do it. And even when you finished it, you don't know if it's publishable or not. Whereas by the time I'm, you know, the stage I'm at now, I'm like, well, actually, I have the craft skills to do this. How am I going to do it? And if I get a bit wrong or something goes off the track somewhere, I need to haul myself back onto the track. You know, I've got those yeah. editorial skills now as well. I'm working quite closely with editors. Um, you know, to I if there's stuff that's not quite right or that needs fine tuning. Mm -hmm. But generally, since the beginning, I've I've always written to a pretty publishable standard. And I think it's that, you know, those years of just reading incessantly, it gives you a really good organic feel. And I do write largely, apart from the, 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 the frame of it, very organically. I often don't go in with a, well, chapter one will be about this and chapter two will be about that. I don't know the whole story necessarily, mm -hmm. but I understand how it should feel. Hmm. And, and I think that's probably the best way to describe it. Having said that, there's no right way to do it. That's the way I yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. But lots of other people <laughs> do it really well you yeah. know, in other ways. So, so you've just got to kind of find your way of how yes. your brain works and how to get that out onto paper in such a way someone else can read it and, yeah. and, and take it in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. And, and so just out of curiosity at a, a more sort of granular level, I mean, what does it actually look like in, in terms of, I've heard, um, and I think I'm correct in saying this, Alexander McCall Smith, for example, when he writes, he says that if he wakes up at three o'clock in the morning and just has this feeling that he needs to write, he'll sit down and he'll write. Um, Tim Ferriss, who's a, a mm. sort of prolific podcaster and writer, he will, you know, he's a night, tends to write more in the, the evenings mm. and will have a glass of wine and that allows him to get into a more creative place. I mean, so in terms of yourself, is there a time of day? Is there a particular location? Is there, you know, do you have a, you know, a glass of wine prior to, <laughs> is there anything like that? Or? I wish I could say that there was. I mean, I like Sandy's technique, getting up at three in the morning. It's <laughs> going to be quite... Um, but I'm not. I'm a sleeper. I'm a snoozer. I'll sleep like s 10 hours a night if you leave me. So generally not up at three o'clock in the morning for <laughs> anything, even exciting <laughs> things, never mind work. So um, I suppose <coughs> I get up in the morning and I, ideally I would love to be able to just do it in the morning and get it done and feel that it was, you know, that I'd, I'd, I'd done the job. Okay. But that's not always possible because sometimes you've got, you know, a reek meeting or a photo shoot or something else that's happening. And mm -hmm. I think this is the thing that when people get into writing, they envisage sort of wandering lonely as a crowd, cloud and doing the writing. But actually, you know, you end up with book festival dates and um, yeah. press stuff to do. And you've got the management of your backlist and you're talking about people who are doing adaptations or things in different media. And you might be writing something else. You could be writing two things at once. So it ceases to become, you know, the, the time that's there, well, just just take that time. It's the space that there is. And so the mm -hmm. glory of sometimes just being on a train and the reception going and you're like, excellent, <laughs> three or four <laughs> hours now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no one can get hold of me quick, I'm gonna do my writing. And so um, it's kind of a bit more like that. And I'm not, to be, to be frank, not much of a drinker. I think I often come across as a drinker and I don't know why. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> that wasn't the insinuation. In that, <laughs> recently though, it happened to me, I was with a friend and, and this friend of mine, we were born in the same week in the same hospital. We've known each other since we were babies, right? Wow. And our, our parents knew each other not brilliantly well, but I mean, we have known each other since we were kids. And he said the other week, something like, oh yeah, you and your cocktails. <laughs> As if I was like a cocktails for breakfast kind of person. I was like, what do you mean? It's like, oh, you writers, you and your cocktails. <laughs> and I do like cocktails, I do enjoy cocktails, but we're talking about one a you know, once a month that that would actually happen because yeah. it's quite busy sort of. So no, I don't, I'm not a great one for that sort of stuff. Just get somewhere that you can get your laptop out and it's reasonably quiet and off you go really. <laughs> okay, what's your favourite cocktail? Well at the moment we have a house cocktail which is called the Selkie and we make that with um, seaweed gin so there's a, a Harris gin, there's mm -hmm. a seaweed gin or there's a Shetland Reel also have a seaweed gin so we've done it with both of these. A little bit of sea salt and I mean really good sea salt and mm -hmm. then homemade elderflower um, which Ooh isn't too sweet. You know, the commercial elderflowers tend to yeah. be really, really sweet. So the one that, that I make isn't isn't so sweet. And that's really an amazing cocktail because it's kind of got that saltiness, but, and it's not too, yeah, it's nice. pretty good. Yeah. So the Selkie at the moment is my big favorite. Yeah. But we quite often, like I had a really good one the other day, a lemon sherbet one mm. down in a pub in Leith. Mm. And it was basically vodka and fresh lemon and a little bit of... of uh, they were going to put sugar on the rim and I was like, stop! 
<laughs> Could you put salt on that rib instead? So I suppose I like things that are not too sweet. Got you. Hmm. <laughs> Great. Um, so the, the Mirabelle Bevan Mysteries. Yes. Um, this is your, uh, I suppose, your kind of, well, I suppose, maybe your primary focus at the moment um, and has been for a, a, a few years. What first inspired you to, to, to start write this? Them. Um, it was Dad. It was really dad. I okay. had I was writing other historicals. So the other set of historicals um, run from 1820 to about 1850. And there are all these mental explorers, like guys who set off to map the Niger with a carrot and some sandwiches and a pair of socks. You know, those kind of mental Georgian early <laughs> Victorian explorers didn't know what they were getting into. Their life expectancy was horrific. Mm -hmm. um, and they were kind of these real adventures. And I'd been writing these books, which are big, thick, chunky books for 130,000 odd words. Oof. I'd written a couple of those and they'd done really well. And then you you wait for the edits. So you hand in the book, you wait for the edits. And I was waiting for the edits and it was the summertime, it was Dad's birthday. And I thought, Dad is often tells stories about his childhood. He was brought up in London and Brighton in the 40s and 50s. And he had a granny in Brighton, so he used to go down there. And he had mentioned standing on the pier or next to the pier in Brighton, looking down on the beach, and it was 1951, and there was this woman who was really beautifully dressed. And in 1951, that's actually a bit of a feat because there's been closed rationing for 10 years. Mm, mm -hmm. So, and thinking, oh, that woman looks really interesting. And he's like 15 or 14 or something. And um, then she started to dodge the deck chair attendant because you're supposed to pay tuppence to sit down on a deck chair, uh -huh. and she didn't want to pay to sit down. And I thought, oh, that's a really interesting character. And Dad said, um, yeah, I always wondered why she'd done that, because she obviously had a lot of money. You know, she was very well dressed and all the rest of it, but she wasn't going to pay him. And I thought, well, I'll write Dad a short story about that woman, you know, for his birthday. While I was waiting for the edits to come through in this book, which I did. And then, I don't know, I just got hauled into the 50s. You know, my idea of the 50s at the beginning of this was Greece. You know, that was what I okay. knew of the 50s. Yeah. And as I was writing this short story, because I'm a bit of a swat, I began to think, oh yeah, actually, when did rationing come off? And what were the working conditions? And what were the living conditions? And what was really, and this decade where my parents had grown up and had met in the mid to late 50s, mm -hmm. and my grandparents, you know, was kind of their heyday. And I was thinking, gosh, this is a really interesting decade in a totally different way from the earlier one. It was almost like the time the empire took off, mm -hmm. which is why it was worthwhile for all these mad adventurers, because of course they could monetize whatever they found. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of would, would their, whatever they found would plug into the burgeoning empire and the manufacturing. So they found amazing plants or, you know, whatever they found they could, they could use. Um, and this was kind of the tailing off of the empire. You've got 48, so India, um, being handed back and um, the British pulling out of Palestine and, you know, this real sense of optimism after the war. So, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. And it was just so fascinating. And pretty quickly I was like, well, this could be a book. And so that first short story I wrote for Dad is basically the first chapter almost of that first Mirabel Bevan book, uh -huh. which is called Brighton Bell. And then I wrote it into a murder mystery and showed it to a friend, Lynn Anderson, who's a, um, another Edinburgh-based crime writer. And she said, the history's great in this, because that's what I was used to writing. When you're writing a new genre, you have to learn the genre. Mm -hmm. She said, the history's great in this. She said, but you're no good at crime. You give them far too much detail. Because these, these two genres, almost, you're doing two different things. So in a historical uh, book, you're spilling the beans. You know, yeah. what's it, like, what underwear are they wearing? And wh how much, you know, what do they have for breakfast? And you tell everything, anything that you can put in to make it rich and luxurious and to take you back in that time machine to 1820 or 1950 or whenever it is. Mm -hmm. But with crime, the whole sort of prize is not, not spilling the beans. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't tell them who did the murder. <laughs> so I then went back and sort of rewrote it a bit um, to sort of hold back some of the murder beans um, <laughs> and showed it to my agent and she really loved it. And I very quickly realized just from the history that this was a fascinating decade. This was a decade in which every year was actually really quite different, which is Pretty unusual, you know, 1850 yeah. is the same as 1855, you know, it's the same world, but that wasn't the case in the 50s, actually. So you have these mm. very grey 1950, 1951, 1952, rationing comes off in 54, um, people are feeling like they've never had it so good, and then you have the kind of threat of the Soviet era, and there's quite a lot of 
really quite big things and it looks different. You know, you, you, you can't always tell that 1871 to 1879, where's that dress from? Mm -hmm. But you can tell 1951 to 1959 quite clearly. Yeah. And just the colours, you know, life becomes more colourful and you're heading into the 60s with, um, you know, the contraceptive pill being available and mm. all kinds of stuff. And so that just seemed to me a really fascinating decade. So when Jenny came back to me and said, I really like this book, do you think it's a series? And actually, Sandy was someone who said to me, you should write a series. That's Alex Adam and Colt Smith yes, that you were mentioning yeah, uh -huh. earlier. Yeah. Um, and I said, yeah, it is. And it runs from 51 to 61 because that's, those are the interesting years. And there's one a year. And each one is kind of a microcosm. So they are slightly different. And I think it's one of my problems with series that quite often it's the same, the same, the same, the same, the same. And I felt that this was an opportunity to genuinely develop a character. So. Mirabelle, who's the, the lady on the beach at the beginning, is effectively what we would consider depressed in 1951. She's been mm. through the war. The end of the war was awful for a lot of people. I mean, it was depressing. Everyone had lost somebody. Everyone had been bereaved. They were delighted the war was over. Mm -hmm. But also the war had been really exciting and everyone had flung themselves into it. Yeah. So you're left in a very kind of world where Britain is broke. Things are very grey. Rationing's still on. Loads of people you loved and uh, have died mm. and mm. you've not really got over that and you're not allowed to talk about it because we don't discuss our feelings in 1951. Mm. Um, and yeah, so she's kind of depressed. And in a way, the entire series is about how Mirabelle cheers up. And she does it through the medium of solving murder mysteries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the thing that cheers her up most. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And I've been writing those, I mean, you say it's the main thing I've been doing, but actually I've been writing those alongside the historicals, yeah, okay, um, yeah. which take a different kind of research and actually quite an intense sort of deep archive research for those historical books, because if you're going to write 130,000 words set in the 1820s, 30s or 40s, <laughs> you've really got to know about the 1820s, 30s yeah, and 40s. Yeah. Um, how, how, yeah. So how do you do that? I mean, there must be so many missing pieces trying <laughs> to put together this jigsaw you know and and and, and uh, you know, kind of relate to yourself to how it would mm. have been then yeah it's about living i mean i think this is the thing that really i prefer about novels the research for novels is that it's about the experience you know nobody wants to read about who was on the throne you might want to read about that person but you don't want to read the formal history what you want to read is what it felt like to ride side saddle or um you know that the illness, how illness is. Illness is yeah. terrifying, terrifying in Georgian Britain. Mm -hmm. You know, really, because you can, you know, you die out of nowhere in a way that we don't today. Light. I mean, the things that are different. There's no light in 1820s. You know, at night you've got a candle. Mm. You know, if you're lucky, you've got a candle. Um, and so, I think that experience of what the food is like and what you know, what it feels like and how you process the danger that's around you and things. And the very um, sort of dangerous nature, I mean, the way marriage is viewed, the way relationships are viewed is very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that comes from, a lot of it comes from archive research, particularly working with letters and journals, okay. which is like a magical sort of thing where you yeah. dig, 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 and it's all really boring, and you're in the archive, and they won't let you have sandwiches in there, and you aren't allowed ink pens, <laughs> and you're like, why did I come here at all? <laughs> and then, <laughs> after some days, you hit a letter or a journal entry or something, and it's just like that person who died 200 years ago is next to you telling you about you know, the first time they saw an elephant or, and they're there and you're like, yeah, that's the connection. And something like that can just spark a whole, you know, a whole story. And these travelers were pretty, I think, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, quite highly educated, extremely brave. You had to be brave. Um, pretty eccentric, really. Uh, and sometimes very greedy. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of them were doing it for the glory. There was a lot of glory mm -hmm. to be had. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they tend to be really interesting characters. And of course, there were no fe you know, very few female stories. So when you find a woman, you know, last year I, I had a book out called On Starlit Seas. On Starlit Seas is the story of Mariah Graham, who was a math scholar, um, essentially. And she spent some time in Chile and in Brazil in the 1820s and was there for the Brazilian War of Independence. Mm -hmm. And she figured out, she was the first person to figure out how to measure an earthquake when she was in Chile. Whoa. And she wrote up all this stuff. She was published by John Murray in London, brought 
back her you know, equation like a good girl. I've looked, I've figured out how to <laughs> measure earthquakes, took it to the Royal Society and they said, girls can't do maths, don't be ridiculous. And they wouldn't let her present her theory. And it wasn't until um, Charles uh, Darwin presented it for her that it was finally, and it's, it's the base, she was right, it's the basis of how we calculate earthquakes today. That's incredible. Yeah, so these, when, you, when you meet someone like her through her letters, through her journals, and mm. through some of their pubs, some of them had published work as well. Yeah. It's really exciting and you're just like, oh, how come I'd never heard of this amazing person? Um, mm. and, and what must that have actually been like? Because how do you take that experience that they were prepared to reveal and spoon feed it to a modern audience so they're, they're there? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's, I love that, that's, yeah. that's my dream. <laughs> so, and it's the same in the 1950s, but it's not, um, I think the reason I can write so many different things at once, and I, uh, or not necessarily once they appear to come at once, because quite often they come out you know, within a couple of months and everyone thinks you wrote them together, but I actually tend to just focus on the one thing when I'm writing, oh, okay. but I'm pretty quick. <laughs> um, but how, how that, I think I'd be bored if I was just doing the mirror pals. Okay. I think I would get bored and it would show in the writing once you're bored and you know what you're doing and you're, but then because I've written two other things in between and you come to Mirabel, you're like, hey, Mirabel, how have you been? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's talk about 1958. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's excellent. So uh, this is a question that I was uh, wondering earlier as well, was that when you started the series originally, I mean, it's between 1951 and 1961, did you have the entire series mapped out from the outset or is it something that's evolved as you've done it? Um, yes and no. I mean, I knew it was one book a year and I kind of knew a bit about what those years were like. So what the fashion was like and things that were new and the political situation because I'd read, you know, I'd read the decade. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of who gets killed or what happens within that, I suppose I generally had an idea that she would start in Brighton, like all depressed people, Mirabel's gone down to Brighton because it's small and she wants to be locked in somewhere. She's from London, mm -hmm. London's too big for her right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so the series sort of opens up. So the first one's Brighton Bell, the second one's London Calling, she can go up to London. England Expects, she's up, up in Cambridge by then. Mm -hmm. um, British Bulldog is the fourth one that's set in Paris. So it kind of expands, her world is expanding really. Okay. Um, although she, there's always a little bit of Brighton in it, always, because that's where she starts. So yeah, I think I kind of had that notion and I knew again what each book would have to feel like okay. to be a representation of that year and of where she was as on her journey to kind of getting over World War II and the people who had died and making a new life for herself that was a worthwhile life. You know, a lot of people came out of the war, women particularly, they'd done these amazing things. You, you just need to speak to some grannies. <laughs> you know, they all turn up at events yeah. and afterwards, there's always a, a couple of you know, older ladies there and they'll come up and say, oh, don't really talk about it, but I did this, this and this during the war. And you're like, oh, you did what? You know, they're <laughs> yeah. amazing. But after the war, they went back into the kitchen. And I think that was really difficult for a lot of women. And so Mirabel isn't going to do that. She's not married, but she has to find a way to sort of something to throw herself into. Um, okay. So that, yeah, I knew that. Who was going to die and, um, and what exactly it was going to be about, I wasn't 100% sure. But I, I mean, now, now I am, I'm on number eight, so I've got three more to go. Yeah. I'm kind of at the point where I'm like, oh, well, I've got to get this in and I've got to get that in. So I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, so I've got a much clearer idea now that I'm further along. Yeah, have you got any spoilers for what's ahead? No, I'm not spoiling. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about, um, I don't know if you've seen the film or, or uh, probably read the book as well, Stephen King's Misery, yes. where Kathy Bates is def desperate to find out what happens to Misery and James <laughs> Cann throws the book in the, the fire or whatever. It's like, what's going to happen? It's the only power we've got. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, okay. So we've covered the, the Mirabel um, series, your writing process. I'm curious to know, as a reader, whether you prefer fiction or non-fiction and why? Bad fiction is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I don't prefer bad fiction, but good writing is sublime, like fictional writing. I've recently been reading Lorna Moon's short stories. I think she's the best short story writer I've ever read. And I'm, I would have said before, 
Damon Runyon probably would have been the best short story writer that I'd ever read. Lauren Emmons, amazing. And I only found her two years ago because she's a Scottish woman that wasn't commemorated ever. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I think her short stories are beautifully crafted. And when fiction is done really well, it is sublime and it is absolutely my favourite. Um, but generally, you're more likely to find a non-fiction book that's readable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's probably the answer to that. Good answer. Mm. <laughs> so, Reek Perfume. Yes. H how did this come oh, to be? This makes no sense to anyone. Let me <laughs> okay. explain it to okay. you. Um, I suppose it was 2016. And yeah, it was 2016, so two years ago. I totally got a bee in my bonnet about two things. Um, one was the way that we were culturally being represented. I kept meeting people from down south and Scotland was just about Tartan and Haggis is Nessie and I kind of had enough of that. That's kind of the global perception, <sighs> I think. <laughs> Dear sweet heaven. Um, and so I wanted to create some kind of, I, I, I'm very much kind of hands on, like, and I wanted to create a product. I relate to history through artifacts and I was like, what are we leaving behind? Are we just going to leave behind the Tartan and the Haggis? And so I had this idea that I wanted to create a brand which would um, represent Scotland really in a more interesting way and that was connected to our real history. Because if you actually read up about the tartan or what they're saying about the tartan, it's not our real history. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's really annoying. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I started to think about that and uh, the company that came out of that was called Urban Reavers and it had three um, different um, kind of uh, brands within that. Mm -hmm. One was called Swally. So Swally is about, um, was about, you know, the drunken Scots. We're not the drunken Scots. We have the best distillers in the world. We have a huge amount of expertise. We really know what we're doing with booze. Uh -huh. And Swally was about cocktails. So, um, <laughs> and we sold a whole load of those actually. There was a brand called Find Your Way Home, which mm -hmm. was about um, maps and historic maps being printed onto things. So we had a lot of uh, scarves and, and stuff and we sold again a whole lot of those. And the third thing was uh, this perfume. I have always been inspired by the Jacobite women. I think I first heard stories of the Jacobite women from dad because he would find little pieces of Jacobite silver which had been made in France after people had retreated after the 15 uprising and after the 45 uprising, they went to France and they went to Italy. And mm. the Jacobites had money. And so they would uh, commission dressing table sets and all kinds of interesting things, snuff mills and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they would often have these really interesting kind of secret codes on them, you know, the white cockade and the white rose and the, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I loved, and dad would tell me the story, some of these stories around these women because the artifacts were female artifacts. They were dressing table sets in particular, stuff from dressing table sets. And then read Maggie Creek's book uh, called Damn Rebel Bitches, which is all about the Jacobite women um, and loved that. Um, and then did some other research myself because, you know, you're an archive, so you can. And um, I decided that these women had not been commemorated, which they haven't because they're on the losing side. Mm. But they were so amazing. Like my favourite Jacobite woman is Lady Nisdale, Winifred Maxwell who broke her husband out of the Tower of London in 1716 by dressing him in drag the night before he was due to be killed for his part in the uprising and smuggling him out of the Tower of London oh as God. one of her wait ladies in waiting. She was amazing. Nobody knows about her, like everyone should know about her. She mm -hmm. was like, she, that, this is the bravery of resistance fighters during World War II. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I wanted to find something that was like a secret sign a way that you could remember somebody in the same mm. way the Jacobites did with this kind of secret language. And I met a brilliant perfumer who's an award-winning perfumer called uh, Sarah McCartney. And I went to Sarah and I said, look, I want to start this brand and it's gonna be called Reek. And she, and told her this story and she was like, I said, can you make this perfume for me? And she was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so called it Damn Rebel Bitches, which is what the yeah. Duke of Cumberland called the Jacobite oh, women because he was heartily sick of them. Um, and I drove Sarah nuts because for me it was very important that the brand worked all the way through and that the smell had to be a smell that would have been familiar to these women. So she created a perfume which was um, blood orange, which was because they were beginning to bring oranges into Scotland at this time and make marmalade. Um, 
and uh, malt because they were women were all brewers, clary sage because this was a herb that was used a lot in women's medicine, oh. hazelnut, big part of the Highland diet at this time was hazelnuts, huge hazelnut colon uh, um, sort of fields I suppose on Colency in the islands. Um, and pink peppercorns. Pink peppercorns was a magical luxury. If you had pink peppercorns in your kitchen, you were doing all right, you <laughs> see. Um, and so she created the scent and we launched it. And of the three brands, Reek was immediately the one that was kind of most interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, we, were, we made 100 bottles of perfume. We were told in the July, August that that would last us till beyond Christmas. And in a m the first month, we sold 70. Wow. So there was a real, there were a lot of bitches out there. <laughs> 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 At which point my daughter came in, my daughter's a makeup artist and art director and mm -hmm. said, these bitches are not only historical, these bitches are current and you need a proper ad campaign. And we started to talk about the way that women were um, portrayed in the media and how bored to death we were of 16 year olds on a motorbike in Paris surrounded by flowers with a man at the end of the ad who arrives because he's come to take her out to dinner or climbed into her room or whatever, and isn't she a rebel? That's not a rebel. <laughs> so <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of very singular idea of beauty, you know, beauty is a very young, size eight blonde girl usually. Yeah. And yeah. I'm kind of bored of it. So we decided that we would create a campaign around real beauty, real women. Our oldest model to date is 81. Um, our largest model is a size 20. We have you know, a complete sort of race diversity in it. We feature yeah. all different kinds of women and we give our models a voice. We started a blog called Bitches Unite and um, <laughs> Bitches Unite gets a massive amount of hits. Um, and on Bitches Unite, we just, it's like a pan-feminist blog really. And we do a lot of stuff about the beauty industry because we are really challenging beauty industry norms. Yeah. And we still only make a hundred bottles a time. And then we make another hundred bottles when we sell out, we sell out, but it means that all our perfume is hand mixed and hand poured by Sarah in her lab. And that means it's completely sustainable. Yeah. Um, and we focus very much on reusable and recyclable packaging um, and all our merch, our you know, teas and totes and things like that is all very kind of ethically sourced. Mm -hmm. We pay everyone the living wage. So um, yeah, so Reek's really about that memorializing women uh, challenging beauty industry norms and being really sustainable yeah. and it's just become a massive part of my life and after bitches we went of course for witches yeah, <laughs> <So> yeah. <laughs> uh, we launched um, witches about not even a year ago actually now about 10 months ago we sold out of the first run in three weeks turns out there are also quite a lot of witches out there um, and <laughs> And we've, we've just, you know, they, it's, it's just been a joy, mm. really. So at the moment, we're working on uh, our next one will be called Pirate Queens. I'm slightly obsessed with the Pirate Queens because all of these, for all of these different perfumes, I do a kind of in-depth research oh, into okay. who were these women and why are they still relevant? Mm -hmm. You know, why do we care about them and where is that spirit today? Yeah. Um, and there sure are a lot of damn rebel bitches out there. And I think there are quite a lot of witches as well. That sense of sisterhood and being part of a coven almost, that really exists within sort of modern female life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's it's just fascinating to me. And yeah. the pirate queens are great. My favorite is Jeanne de Clisson, who is a French woman, medieval woman, who the King of France killed her husband. And um, she basically took the knickers, bought herself a ship called the Revenge, and um, ended up with a, a fleet of, I think, three ships, um, and just attacked French shipping to annoy the king because oh he'd, he'd killed off her husband. Um, <laughs> and there's a brilliant Chinese pirate called um, Madame Cheng, who um, basically had 300 junks in the South China Sea um, in the late 1800s as well, was probably the most successful pirate that ever lived, and negotiated her retirement with the Chinese government because they had to get her off the water because she was just paralyzing their trade. Oh yeah. um, and they paid her off and all her crew. So, yeah, <laughs> they're pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, Damn Rebel Bitches was called the, f the first feminist fragrance. Mm. And I know this is something that you're very passionate about. The word feminism, I googled it, it says <laughs> the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of the equality of the sexes. But I feel as though in modern culture, often it's 
not necessarily always kind of represented in that way. Mm. So what does feminism mean to you? Uh, equality. Feminism equality. is definitely about, I'm looking forward to the day we don't have to use the word feminism because we have more equality and it's a, a, about that. And certainly, I mean, on the blog, like there are all different kinds of feminists. My mother is 81. She believes herself to be a feminist. She's not really a modern, <laughs> in the modern, you know, way of things. Yeah. She ain't no feminist really, because her feminism is the feminism of the late 50s. Like mum was one of the first women to go on the pill and she was delighted with herself okay. about that, okay? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, and, and then you look at radical feminism today. I mean, it, yeah. it's a real, there's a huge breadth in it. Yes. Um, my daughter is much more radical, again, than I am. And so when we set up Bitches Unite, we very specifically wanted to do something that was sex positive, that provided voices for everyone along this spectrum, um, that could be a place for debate and for soapboxing ideas. Um, or for people just to talk. I mean, particularly, I think one of the interests that I have is in women whose images are used. So we do a lot with models and we do a lot with um, people who are in the public eye, so actresses and, and people in, in bands and things mm -hmm. about what the world does to your body in order to make you acceptable. Mm. And then also we talk to a lot of young, particularly young, but not exclusively young activists, okay. radical activists. So we. Um, interview people from Room from Rebellion, which was um, the sort of London wing of the Repeal the Eighth movement, um, and feminists who are working in all different kinds of campaigns, you know, period poverty or um, all different kinds of stuff that's going on. And yeah. it's a really exciting time. Um, mm -hmm. We're yet to see what we get out of this exciting time, but yeah. it is a really exciting time. And so I find when I edit these pieces, I get really stimulated because quite often the ideas are a little bit challenging or yeah. the voice isn't, because it isn't your voice. And that's when you back around that table that I was brought up around where you're like, mm. well, okay, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm interested to know how you, uh, I mean, what sort of changes would you like to see in order to mm. make a more equal society? But also, what is the, the acid test to know that we are, you know, things are equal and it's not, the pendulum hasn't swung to the point that it's, you know, men are being oppressed? Listen, let's <laughs> worry about it when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> we are so far from that. Do you think so? <laughs> yeah, yeah, way far from that. Um, I suppose pay equality would, pay would make... Pay um, we we uh, one, we make stickers for different causes. We'd repeal the eight stickers, which we sold out of. And the one we sold out of most recently is our Fuck the Pay Gap stickers. <laughs> um, am I allowed to say that on here? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but they yeah. went like hotcakes. <laughs> um, my hour is worth the same as his. So that's another one that we have. Um, keep your laws off my body. Um, so uh, those are concomitant with the repeal the eighth, but there is a lot of stuff around, you know, women's bodies being controlled and the way women look being controlled. So if you talk to Muslim women about, yeah. you know, uh, th there's a big campaign actually at the moment in Iran of video campaign of uh, women dancing. It's illegal for in, in Iran for women to dance, not mm. allowed to dance in public. And so these um, brilliant dancers, by the way, have taken to the streets and they're just dancing in the streets and videoing themselves and posting it. And that's actually, I mean, they can end up in prison for that in Iran. Um, so, yeah, that, 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 those kind of challenging things, you know, around what you can do with your body and what you can do with your behaviour. Yeah. I wrote a really interesting article about four years ago for BBC History, um, which was about the history of toplessness. So how toplessness has gone from being not acceptable to being acceptable, you know, it's not, it's not a straight line. People are always yeah. looking for those beautiful straight lines. We have no straight lines in our history. <laughs> yeah. So you get kind of the Puritans deciding you can't be topless at all. You can't even show your <laughs> neck. Uh, and then the next thing you know, Charles II is reinstated and everyone's practically topless all the time. And all of those makeup sets that the Stuarts had made all have little pots of carnelian for nipple makeup because women go pretty much topless to parties. Uh. Um, uh, it's pretty chilly in London <laughs> in the winter in the 1660s. Um, and then you have the Victorian thing where, you know, there's no toplessness at all and that's disgusting and, you know, it's, it's only for art and mustn't be voyeuristic. And we still have this taboo of toplessness, which is actually a Victorian taboo most recently. Mm. So, um, and that impinges on a lot of things like breastfeeding. You know, it's okay to breastfeed in public, which is a big campaigns about. Mm -hmm. um, 
and yeah so that kind of stuff i'm really interested in that kind of stuff yeah it's really interesting yeah excellent i'm going to ask you a few questions now that are slightly bigger kind of philosophical topics okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you not think that's your, uh, Go your for milieu? It. I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first one is really about purpose. I mean, this is something that I really enjoy, um, you know, asking people about. Is really about why they feel, you know, what's their thing? What do they feel is their purpose in life? I'm a really good listener. Okay. I'm to be a good novelist and actually in business as well. Uh huh. Being a really good. I mean, I haven't today listened because I've been gabbing. But normally I'm a very good listener and that helps you, if you listen well, you can really understand what somebody's about. People tell you everything. Mirabelle often says this, people tell you everything if, they only let, if you only let them. They might not say it directly, mm. but you can tell from the nuances of their language. So I think for me, one of my best skills in terms of what beyond my purpose, I'm also an agitator. <laughs> so I'll listen to you and challenge you and sometimes you don't even realise you've been challenged. Um, and I quite enjoy that. I suppose that would be my purpose as an agent for, I wouldn't even say change, I'd say as an agent for thought. I love that. So, yeah, that, uh, I'd, love, I'd love it if that was, you know, if we're looking for purpose, it's got to be on your gravestone, hasn't it? An agent for thought. That's brilliant. That should be oh, on my that's gravestone. So good. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> this possibly ties into that. I mean, what do you feel you would like your, your legacy to be? Well, I've just written a book that um, includes 800 Scottish women, about 650 of whom I had never heard of before, and I'm interested in Scottish women. The degree to which we do not commemorate our female history is extraordinary. Mm. And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about women who achieved stuff globally as well as locally, as well as nationally, as well as globally, yes. nationally, and locally. Mm -hmm. um, we generally don't do it. Yeah. Um, and so I would my, like my legacy to be everyone smelling really good, because being smelling good is very important, <laughs> but that, that having been an agent for change within that to, 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 to even up that legacy. Because I think one of the things that when I was writing this book was really mm -hmm. interesting, there were two or three things actually, but this one thing I kept thinking, this woman thinks she's the first. You'd, you'd read of a Victorian woman who was a healer, you know, doctor, mm -hmm. and she thinks she's the first doctor. Now, she is the first doctor to graduate in medicine from wherever. But then you go back to a medieval woman who, in fact, was known as a healer, acted as a doctor, but this woman didn't know about the first woman because we don't commemorate our women. So yeah. you get this over and over, all di different kinds of fields, tax collectors. The first tax collector, female tax collector, was in Dundee in the 1300s. You don't know that when you're in the Victorian era that you weren't the first because it, it's just not commemorated. Yeah. Huge medieval f philanthropist, businesswoman from the medieval era. You know, we think that it didn't happen. It happened all the time, mm. you know. Um, and so I'm not saying these women had a quality of opportunity. They definitely, definitely didn't. Mm -hmm. But if you don't commemorate those achievements, then you think you're the first and it's much more difficult to be the first. Yeah. Yeah. So I would like to contribute to women not realising that they have to be the first, hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. hmm. How do you define success? Oh, that's a tricky, tricky question. <laughs> well, every day I, when I go to bed, I think of the 10 things that made that day a great day. That's brilliant. And I really enjoy that. And it can be something really stupid from, you know, I had the best breakfast I've had in some days. <laughs> <laughs> it was an excellent breakfast. <laughs> to, you know, a book came out or I got the opportunity to speak at an event that I've always wanted to speak at. Mm -hmm. or met somebody, you know, all of those. It could be anything in that, in that range. So a successful day is a day where I have 10 and I don't have to think. That's that's a successful day. Um, huh. In terms of success, I suppose a, 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 the traditional way of thinking of success is impact or money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you're in the creative fields and you judge yourself just on the money, you're onto a loser, because it doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't work like that. It's not commensurate. 
um, and some things you make a lot of money for and some things you don't make any money for and the things that you don't make much money for aren't necessarily worse than the things that you made lots of money for. So in the creative field, you, you can't go there. You've just got to make the books balance. In business, you can, but in the creative field, you can't. But in terms of impact, I think that is successful if people, if you make people think, okay. if you change things, if you open things up a bit, then that would probably be, huh. in the larger sense, my yeah. feeling. Yes, because I, I was just thinking in terms of what you're saying there about the creatives. Um, if money isn't the metric of success, then mm. how do you establish your value in the world? Mm. It's impact. Impact. And it's impact. So it totally makes my day. Someone, somebody will come back on Twitter and say, I've read this book. It might be a book that you wrote 10 years ago. Hmm. I've read this book and I love it. And it's made me think about this. And you're like, oh, day made. You know, had an impact. Yeah. And that might be one person or that might be, you know, 200 people at a book festival. You can't, you know, you've just got to enjoy that impact, I think. Yeah. That's Thanks. success. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Hmm. Well, my nana, my mum's mum, she was a very um, grumpy lady. I'm not going to lie. Um, and she always said to me, don't mind the boys. <laughs> By which she meant my brothers. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> she had nine brothers and she was the youngest. She wow. had two sisters and nine brothers. And largely she didn't like her brothers. <laughs> yeah. So when I was growing up, my granny was always around. She, was, she looked after us some of the time and she was always there. She's very much part of our lives. And my brothers would do something that was like, well, we can play tennis better than you, which they totally could, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and Nana would say, don't mind the boys. And that was coming from her background as well. And I suppose that was in some ways the best advice because mm -hmm. You know, in my industry, in the writing industry, if you're looking at writing industry, not so much in the beauty industry, funny enough, but in the writing industry, you know, women are reviewed less, they get paid less, they get um, nominated for fewer awards. Y mm. You know, I if you look at it, there's a, an annual review. Um, every year they do a kind of stock take and every year it's the same. There are um, fewer female critics, there are few more, fewer female, you know, re reviews about women's books, about women's writing. So. Yeah. Don't mind the boys. <laughs> if you had the opportunity to speak to your 20 year old self, oh my what, what would you say? It's a tricky section. <laughs> um, 20, well, at 20, I had met my first husband. I was living in Ireland. Um, I was very insecure, I think, as well. I mean, I'd come from. I'd come from being the odd one out. You know, my family was always the odd one out. And I had very different political views from my parents, which they were cool with, but I was still very different from them. Mm -hmm. So I think I kind of struggled for a long time to kind of find my feet and not be the odd one out. So I suppose I might give myself some advice around that and say, you know, it's going to be okay. Um, you just need to find your voice. And it, I mean, it, take, it took me a long time, really, to find my voice. And I think, in a way, that's why I started writing fiction, because it was easier to give someone else a voice mm -hmm. than to find my own. And it's only recently where I've been able to write journalism and nonfiction, which is my voice, my actual voice. It's me, and I stand up and say, you know, this book was written by me, and this is my voice. Whereas with fiction, in a sense, you can hide behind that. Yeah. You know, you can say, well, that character did that, but that wasn't me. And it's not you, but it's a way of kind of cloaking your voice if you like because some of that book will be you but mm. nobody from the outside will know which which bits well, if you've done it right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, it just out of uh, mm. pure curiosity and um, on the there's a sort of quadrant um the political spectrum mm. which is left right libertarian authoritarian i mean where are you on that see i know uh, like putting filling in any forms is a nightmare my insurance guy that does all the insurance for us is like i'm sending you a form and then he laughs because my whole life doesn't fit into a form like it makes no sense none of it i am both libertarian in some issues yeah. i'm really authoritarian in others um i'm probably towards the left is about the most general thing you could say. I'm not very right wing. My parents are much more right wing. My family much more right wing. My close family than I am. Uh -huh. So I would be to the left, but there's and quite a for it, the yeah. yeah. But, that, but that libertarian authoritarian thing depends on the issue, really. 
Interesting. Yeah, because I'm quite, in, in, you know, I'm quite, you know, I f my, my feeling is that to make the kind of change in gender equality, we are going to have to do quotas. I okay. think if you want to change your behaviour and it's so ingrained, you at least have to start by deciding you're going to, you know, you're going to aim for 50-50 or wh whatever it is that you're aiming for in that particular field. Yeah. Um, and that is going to have to be imposed before it becomes normal enough because the Overton window on that has to shift, the, the, the thing that is viewed as normal has to shift. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and that's quite authoritarian. But then I'm very libertarian about sex workers, for example, or mm. some of those issues I'm much more libertarian about. Mm -hmm. so. I know that you were um, very pro-independence at the yep. time. You, sp you were quite, um, I don't want to say outspoken, you spoke out about it. Mm. Why? Why were you pro-independent? Or you probably still are. I didn't start out being pro. I was a no. Right? I was really? a massive big no. <laughs> I was a no, 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 no. I was like totally Father Ted on no. Um, yeah, and then I suppose I read a lot. I read a lot of articles. I started to look into, I'm not very good at economics, but I started to read a bit of economics. Um, speaking to various friends, but on both sides, I mean, I, I've met some people who say, I didn't know anyone that didn't agree with me. You know, on both, I've met, you know, people yeah. on no and yes. yes. Um, my, my life was <laughs> full of people who were no and yes. Um, and just gradually began to think, I think, I suppose the thing that really did it for me is, I feel that Westminster is giving us incredibly poor governance and mm. I feel we can do this better ourselves. Okay. And for me, it was really about that um, and in that sense, had we been offered absolute Devo Max, mm -hmm. really Devo Max, <laughs> then I probably would have gone for that, actually. So I felt that the governance that we're getting, and I still feel, particularly at the moment, the governance yeah. we're getting from Westminster is exceptionally rubbish, mm -hmm. and that we can do better. So I suppose that's where it came from. And I think as well, if you're a, a, a country, we're a country, um, and you consistently vote for not one thing, but you don't get it, and there's not enough negotiation on that, or any negotiation on that, in fact. Yeah. Um, and so historically, looking back, not from the 50s, actually, we, we voted as a union in the 50s, actually. Scotland was very much like the rest of the UK. Um, but post 50s, gradually, we've begun to vote very fairly differently, I think, mm -hmm. um, and think quite differently. And um, if that doesn't find its voice in governance and a place in governance, which it historically hasn't, then that's never going to, that just seems to me like an unsupportable system. You can impose it for a bit, but people are going to get ratty about that. So, yeah. um, so it's really about governance for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last question is, uh, it's a big question, my secret weapon. <laughs> if, you, if, if you could change anything in the world, oh my God. <laughs> what would you do and why? Um, Oh no, <laughs> this is terrible because I'm now hamstrung between independence for Scotland and equal pay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> equal pay, I suppose equal pay worldwide would make such an incredible difference. Like if that just happened, yeah. then that would really change the world. That would have a huge impact. I'd have a, a huge impact on the way that women view themselves, I think. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'd have to go for that, but oh, Indy's in there, just especially at the moment with this Brexit thing, it's grim, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Sarah, it's been so much fun speaking with you. Yeah, I've absolutely you. loved this interview. <laughs> um, really fascinating. It's, you know, we've covered a, a breadth of things and gone quite deep as well. And just finding out more about your story is brilliant. And, oh, thank uh, you. You know, I think the work that you're doing is, is fantastic and power to you. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. Cheers.